I love the idea of friends of the public domain. I see by our respective briefs that there are actually quite considerable differences among us, but yet they are clearly differences of people who are all agreed with a common core of commitment to our public domain. So the controversy in Golan v. Holder uh, is about the constitutionality of Section 514 of the Uruguay Round Agreement Act. Uh, what is that? Section 514 came out of the 1994 round of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Uh, a part of that uh, round of the GATT uh, talks, uh, the, the TRIPS agreement, the trade-related aspects of intellectual property came out of that. That agreement required compliance with Article 18 of the Berne Convention on Intellectual Property. What does all of this mean? The main thrust of all of this uh, was a, um, there's some disagreement among the parties, but either a requirement or at least an encouragement of countries who joined the Berne Convention to grant retroactive copyright status to works by foreign authors with whom the signatory country uh, had not previously had treaties granting copyrights or who, uh, or in cases when those foreign authors hadn't been able to comply with copyright formalities and therefore their works hadn't been copyrighted in the signatory country. So, um, the petitioners in this case sued uh, uh, arguing that Section 514's retroactive grant of copyrights which removed substantial number of works from the public domain is unconstitutional. Um, who are the petitioners? The petitioners are a diverse group of people with interests in working with materials in the public domain or in making or having made derivative works from the public domain. Uh, people like orchestra conduct conductors, uh, those who uh, sell sheet music, film archivists, film distributors, and the like. So this diverse group uh, with particular interests in uh, the public domain. It's worth noting that because of the lengthy copyright term in the US, uh, Section 514 takes works from the public domain from as far back as 1923. So we're talking about a large, large uh, number of works over a large expanse of time that now have retroactive copyrights. There are some famous examples, uh, the famous work uh, uh, used by many Many orchestras used to teach children uh, music, Peter and the Wolf, uh, various other musical works by Stravinsky, and many, many other uh, works that you would recognize, uh, uh, many of which are detailed in the amici briefs. What are the arguments the Supreme Court is considering? There are two arguments, uh, two constitutional arguments. One, that the Section 514 is unconstitutional under the Copyright Clause. Two, that uh, Section 514 is unconstitutional under the First Amendment. The petitioners argue that the, the requirement that uh, exclusive rights be granted for limited times in the Copyright Clause has been violated by Section 514. Uh, in very brief, their argument is that if the government has the power to take uh, works from the public domain and grant copyright status to them, this effectively eviscerates any notion of limited times or limitations on the uh, uh, on copyright, and that it also violates a long historical tradition of things remaining in the public domain once they are there. The government, of course, disagrees. It argues that, uh, look, copyright's been granted. It's still for limited time, life of the author plus 70 years, uh, so that's fine, and uh, the government thinks there's no restriction whatsoever on Congress's right to remove works from the public domain, so long as they have a rational basis for doing so. So a lot of room for disagreement there. The second constitutional issue, the First Amendment issue, uh, is as follows. Uh, there's a First Amendment issue here because every con uh, copyright law is speech restrictive, right? You get a copyright, no one can copy your work. Well, that restricts other people's speech and that they can't use uh, that work without permission. So the petitioner's argument on the First Amendment is that Section 514 fails intermediate scrutiny because there's no legitimate interest that the government has in giving exclusive rights to foreign authors at the expense of the public's rights in works in the public domain. They say that interest isn't legitimate. Uh, they also uh, argue that the 514 is not narrowly tailored to any in legitimate interest the government has. 
The petitioners have certain arguments that they make in their brief as to how Section 514 could have been more narrowly ta tailored and could have better protected the public and those with reliance interests in retroactively copyrighted works. I actually depend a lot on the public domain to do my work. As a copyright historian, most, if not all, of the published primary sources that I must review and rely upon are out of print. Uh, and the few that are around, you know, there are very few of them, and they tend to be located in far-flung places, excuse me, so it's hard, it would be extremely hard for me to access all of this material if there was no public domain. Uh, and importantly, I think also because of the public domain and um, the new technology that takes advantage of it, historical research has been able to make a quantum leap forward just in the last five years. Uh, we are now able to do things, say for example, in a year that uh, maybe before would have taken us three or five years to do. In some case, would have taken so long that we wouldn't have done it at all. I first got involved in the area of copyright history with the Eldred versus Ashcroft case, which the Supreme Court decided in 2003. Uh, and that issue involved whether copyright term extension was constitutional. The Constitution says copyrights and patents can only be granted for limited times. And here Congress was adding 20 years to the term of all existing copyrights. And uh, you know, I looked at that and I said, well, that, that can't be right, because if, if Congress can just keep extending the terms, that's not really a limited time. And, that, and here, I think, we're not swimming against that history, because every time Congress has extended terms under copyright, they scrupulously avoided restoring copyrights. And throughout, when they did it several times in the 1970s, in the legislative history, they expressly said they were doing it because they had no power to restore copyrights, so they had better extend them to keep them under copyright uh, until the, the general extension was passed. Uh, now, I should begin by stating that I'm, I've, I've never been a fan of, the, of copyright extension or even less uh, retroactive protection, uh, but I will admit candidly that it's not as much because of the public domain, but because I hold the very naive view that copyright should in some way, shape, or form be helpful to creators. And I really don't see how either extension or retroactive protection achieves that aim in any, in any way. Uh, Article 18.3 refers to, the, to a principle. Um, and this is where my brief and some pro-government briefs differ uh, fundamentally. So the, the principle, uh, this principle of Article 18 is presented by WIPO, uh, WIPO, as being entirely encapsulated in Article 18.1, which provides, I read, uh, this convention shall apply to all works which, at the moment of its coming into force, have not yet fallen to the public domain in the country of origin through the expiry of the term of protection. Now, that's 18.1. Then there's 18.2, which reads, if, however, through the expiry of the term of protection, which was previously granted, a work has fallen into the public domain of the country where protection is claimed, that work, here come the big words, shall not be protected anew. Uh, I remember in the midst of the argument of Eldred uh, having this flash of recognition of the opportunity for Golan, um, which was presented in the exchange between the Solicitor General and Justice Souter, where Souter was trying to find a line, a bright line, and the Solicitor General signaled pretty clearly he thought the bright line was the public domain. Once something went into the public domain, there it was. Um, and Souter tried to get him to commit to that, and he backed off just at the very end. But it was clear the court wanted a, a, a line, and that was going to be the line. And my sense was, whatever happened in Eldred, Golem was going to be a great case. And, and so the question, the ultimate question that decided Eldred, wrongly even under this standard, but OK, um, let's not fight that battle again, um, was that uh, the tradition has been that Congress has extended the term of existing copyrights, and whenever tradition permit, whatever tra tradition permits, we're not going to second guess. But if you step outside of tradition, all bets are off. And we've got to ask the question of what's consistent with the other values in the Constitution, primarily the First Amendment, if tradition doesn't justify your behavior. So um, conceptually, there's a, there's a sloppiness, I think, when people talk about the public domain, when they don't specify the jurisdiction for which they are uh, the jurisdiction to which they are referring. So things are in the public domain 
um, in one jurisdiction and not in the public domain in another jurisdiction. And when you live in a federal system like the United States, something could be in the public domain in a particular state, but not in the public domain for the United States as a whole. And the case that so clearly brought this out, again, decided after Elgib was filed, after Golan was filed, was the Capitol Records case from the New York um, Court of Appeals, which plainly says, look, we have had a common law copyright in New York since the very beginning. Even though the material here was in the public domain in the place in which it was created, namely England, it's not in the public domain here in New York, and therefore um, New York law can be appealed to for the purpose of uh, regulating the continued use of something that was liberated in its original jurisdiction of creation. Um, so, so we wanted to, to get the court first to recognize that to speak accurately, you've got to say the public domain for which jurisdiction? Okay. In 1790, Congress faced a world in which states had differing common law copyright regimes. The New York Court of Appeals has said New York's common law copyright regime automatically granted a, a perpetual copyright um, for all work uh, um, by the nature of the common law. So we know in at least one jurisdiction in the United States, work was per perpetually protected, which means that there was no public domain of the United States in 1790, um, in the sense that there was no ability to take a work and go anywhere in the United States and freely use it, because at least in New York, you wouldn't be able to freely use it. The 1790 Act radically changes that, because the 1790 Act all of a sudden creates a mechanism by which we know which works are actually in a public domain of the United States, meaning in no jurisdiction in the United States can anybody restrict your ability to use that work. So if that's true, it's conceptually impossible that Congress restored work from the public domain in 1790 because there was no public domain of the United States in 1790. There's no work to be restored from um, uh, the public domain in 1790. And so therefore, tradition in 1790 does not justify a statute which attempts to restore work from the public domain. Um, so, so that was the essence of what we tried to contribute. But my prediction is, um, you know, rare for me, but I'm optimistic. Uh, I'm optimistic. But not in the first, I don't think the court will want to decide this in the First Amendment context. So. Now here's my point of departure from you. You rest your case on the idea that there was no public domain before 1790. Of the United States. No public domain of the United <coughs> States before 1790. I fundamentally disagree with that. Before there was the United States of America, there were the sovereign citizens in a public domain. We, as sovereign citizens, in our public domain, created the United States through our, we constituted the United States. And in constituting the United States, we gave our Congress authority to create limited monopolies within the public domain, from which the whole business started. But the, the concept that has been set foot and allowed to grow, and for which the Supreme Court has become an advocate, is the concept of infringement. What is an infringement? If you, if you start at 1790, an infringement was well, let's see. You, you, you start quoting the Constitution. David, you started quoting the Constitution. All right. Exclusive right. Right to what? To what? The Constitution doesn't say. It's clear what they were talking about. Limited monopolies to sell copies of your work. If, if you start with the idea that the public domain is our sovereign space, and we are friends of the public domain, fighting for our liberty in this space in many ways. We've got First Amendment fronts and copyright fronts, but it's our liberty that we're talking about. And if you take that stance and say, it's the responsibility of the judiciary of the United States to protect our constitutional liberty, you, you, 
you, Supreme Court, are not supposed to be on the copyright holder's side. You're supposed to be on we the people's side.